Okay, it is a pleasure to have Eric Colin Liberdier today, and he will tell us about optimal trans to optimal topological simplification of surfaces, algorithms, and hardness. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so let me start with an apology. So I will uh, some I will describe some uh, works which are not so recent at the beginning, but at the end I promise uh, I will uh, present more recent results, and I think it's good to have uh, those preparations first. Um, again, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have uh, questions, either by uh, by speaking or uh, in the chat. So this talk is about uh, optimal topological simplification of surfaces. So uh, first, maybe I uh, to check that we're all on the same page. Let me recall what uh, what is a surface for me. So uh, there are three equivalent definitions of topological surfaces. The first definition, the mathematical one, is a two manifold. And uh, for this talk, every surface will be compact and connected and orientable also, uh, also it's not really necessary, but uh, let's assume that for simplicity. Um, a more combinatorial definition is uh, that it is a space obtained by, uh, from a, a bunch of polygons by gluing uh, edges in pairs. And finally, the classification theorem for surfaces tells you that uh, you can also define it uh, as a uh, topological sphere, a space obtained from the sphere by attaching a bunch of handles. So this is a handle. It's a genus one uh, with one boundary component. So if you take a sphere or like a surface of a tube, you remove three disks and you attach three handles, then you get uh, a surface uh, with genus free. The so genus G is the number of handles and it's an arbitrary uh, non-negative integer. That's for surfaces. So what are we going to talk about uh, today? <clears throat> Uh, my goal is to uh, explain how to compute shortest curves or graphs to simplify surfaces topologically. And more specifically, so the first problem we'll study is uh, the following. So given a surface uh, with some genus, find the shortest non-trivial closed curve on a surface. So here you see that this curve is non-contractible when you cut the surface along it. Uh, it's actually non-separating when you cut the surface along it you simplify the topology in the sense that you remove uh, you decrease the genus by one as a spoiler this is an easy problem easy computationally i mean and the second problem we'll study is uh, a bit more drastic so more drastically we want to uh, kill the topology of a surface by uh, drawing a graph on that surface such that when we cut the surface along this graph, uh, we get something that's homeomorphic to a disk, something like that. And we want to do that in a, the most economical way, uh, in the sense that we want to minimize the length of the graph. As a spoiler, this is a hard problem computationally. I mean, we have some algorithms, but uh, they're expensive, time consuming. We'll see that. Uh, why should we, should we worry? So uh, related fields, uh, well, uh, I mean, I don't claim that all those uh, algorithms can, can be applied immediately in, uh, in several applications, but still they are uh, relevant, I think. The first problem is relevant in topological simplification or remeshing or approximation, because uh, whenever you have a 3D mesh, well, or say a, a surface mesh of a 3D object, uh, in many cases, you need to simplify the topology. One example is given by, uh, it's given here. It's an example taken by Wood uh, and colleagues. Uh, so this is a Buddha, a, a statue scanned using a 3D scanner. And when you look at the raw output of the mesh, uh, if you take this statue and you zoom in to this small square, you get the middle image here. When you zoom in into this middle uh, small square, you get this right image. And here you see a very small handle. And this is actually a problem if you want, for example, to simplify a mesh. Uh, simplifying a mesh, typically, you would do that by locally uh, contracting edges or removing vertices. But here, it's clear that you need to change the topology for this purpose. And then it's natural to simplify the small handles 
So having, being able to compute shortest uh, non-trivial closed curves that will kill some genus is relevant. The second problem uh, could be related to parametrization. Parametrization means I have a surface with genus and I want to put it into bijection, well, into correspondence in a sense with, uh, with a disk. And this is useful for texture mapping, uh, which is a nice uh, application. So in particular, uh, if, again, if your surface has genus and you want to put it into correspondence with the disk, you need to cut the surface in a way. Uh, this is obvious. If you want to uh, map the texture of the earth into a double torus, you need to cut somewhere, right? Uh, it can be useful also for compression and numerical analysis. And moreover, uh, cutting the surface, well, you probably want to do that in an economical way because you don't want to cut uh, everywhere. You want to, uh, the graph to be as short as possible because it introduces irregularities in, uh, in what you're doing typically. Uh, in more uh, theoretical areas, I'm more into theory. Uh, those problems are interesting in computational geometry topology, of course, this is the field I come from. It's also interesting in graph algorithms. So I will not have time to discuss that in detail, but uh, whenever you have a hard uh, graph algorithmic problem, uh, then it makes sense to look at its, uh, how difficult it is for simpler instances, typically planar graphs, and if it's uh, doable for planar graphs, then why not look at what happens for low genus graphs? And uh, typically there is this extension for planar graphs to uh, low genus graphs uh, would be achieved by first cutting the surface into a plane. Uh, of course, it's, uh, I mean, there are lots of details, but the general approach, uh, it's useful to cut the surface into a disk to get back to a planar problem. I will not uh, pro provide more details, but that's interesting, I think. So unless there are questions, uh, let me look at the first uh, problem, which is computing shortest non-trivial closed curves. Um, okay, so there are three types of simple closed curves on surfaces. Uh, the first type is the set of contractible closed curves. Uh, they are trivial in a sense that, uh, well, it's a bounded disk. You have the non-separating ones here in green. Maybe this one, I mean, there are more examples, but I took two of them. Non-separating means that when you cut the surface along those curves, you do not disconnect it. And you have the splitting closed curves, which are separating, but non-contractible. You can, you can homotop this splitting closed curve with this blue curve, but you cannot contract it uh, to a point continuously while staying on the surface. Um, okay, so the problems we want to study uh, here, there are two problems. We want to compute the shortest non-trivial closed curve where non-trivial can mean uh, two different things. The first uh, meaning would be compute the shortest non-contractible closed curve either of the green or the blue type. And this is called uh, systole in top geometry and topology or edge width in uh, topological graph theory, so it's the same. In other words, we want to compute a homotopically non-trivial curve, which is as short as possible. And the second case is how to compute a shortest non-separating closed curve here from the green type. Uh, it's also homology systole. Uh, actually, it's really uh, a shortest curve that is homologically non-trivial. Homologically trivial means separating. It's really the same here. That's what we want to compute. Um, I was, okay, until here I've only uh, discussed topology. I did not say about uh, geometry. And here you see that I want to compute shortest things. So I should explain what I mean by shortest. I, we need a metric. But let me postpone this discussion until uh, later. So let's, for intuition, if you want, uh, assume that all surfaces are, say, Riemannian surfaces in R3. Obviously, it's uh, hard to compute on such uh, general objects, but uh, the intuition is still useful for It's actually better to think in these terms, I think, for, for now. <clears throat> um, we want to compute shortest non trivial loops. And here is an important property uh, of those loops. <clears throat> Uh, okay, first, okay, sorry. We want to compute that overall shortest non-trivial 
closed curve. And as an intermediate step, let us fix a point B on the surface, S. Uh, and we are looking for a shortest uh, non-trivial loop based at B. So I, I'm fixing a base point. I'm considering only the, lo the loops or the closed curves that pass through B. And such, uh, well, the shortest non-trivial loop based at B has a very special property, which is important. It is geodesic. What do I mean by that? I mean that take, okay, this is the loop L we want to compute. Uh, the shortest non-contractible and non-separating passing through B. I claim that for any point P on this loop, then some shortest pass from P to B belongs entirely in L. In other words, when I start working on this loop from B, <coughs> uh, everything I've traveled through until here is a shortest pass. It's a shortest pass. And at some point, uh, it's not the shortest pass anymore, but what remains uh, in the loop is the shortest pass. Okay? That's what I mean by geodesic. And the proof is actually very simple. It's such the fact that homotopy or homology uh, are, well, uh, it's an algebraic property being tri homotopically trivial or homology trivial. Or really trivial. Uh, let's think it in terms of homotopy first, if you, if you want. Uh, homology is the same. Um, assume, okay, I claim that this property also, let's assume uh, for sake of a contradiction that I have one point P such that uh, on the loop, such that the shortest path between P and B uh, doesn't, uh, is not in L. So this is the, the, the black path here. Uh, then what happens? I have one loop, the left part of the figure here, which is shorter than L because black is shorter than light blue. Similarly, uh, black light blue is a loop that is shorter than L, again, because, this bl because black is the shortest path. And I claim that one of them, at least, is non-contractible, uh, which concludes because I have a, a loop that is non-contractible, non-trivial, and shorter than L, which is a contradiction. So why is that? Assume that this is contractible and that is contractible. Then, uh, because I'll homotopy is a group, I have that L is contractible, which is not the case. Again, L by definition was the shortest non trivial loop. So we have this nice, uh, nice property of shortest non trivial loops, they are geodesic. And this leads us to uh, defining what is the well, the cut locus, which is a standard object, but this is what matters here. Uh, the cut locus, it's a graph embedded on the surface. It's defined with respect to the base point B. And you informally, you can describe it as follows. So look at this figure here. So in my drawing, the base point is on the back of the double torus. You start growing a disc around B like that. It's still, the disc is still behind. Now the disk comes on top of the double torus, at least in part. And here you continue growing, then you have self-collisions. And uh, you draw lines, red lines, when uh, the disk self-collides. And you continue this process until the disk fills the entire surface. So let me do that again, maybe. You start with a small disk around B, you grow it, you grow it. At some point, you have self-collisions, so you, you get your cut locus in red here. And a more complicated picture, depending on the metric, could be something like that. So formally, uh, it's a closure of the set of points with several shortest paths to B. I mean, any point not on the red graph, it has a unique shortest path to B. And by the previous discussion, uh, if L is the shortest non-trivial loop based at B, then uh, you see that L crosses C. Well, first L has to cross C because, uh, because it's geodesic. If L did not cross C, then we would walk along the shortest path from B to somewhere here. And then immediately after we pass this point, we would have to go back and then use the same shortest path. So this path would be, this loop would be contractible. 
Another way to see this is that the cut locus, when you cut along it, you, you get a disk because we are inflating a disk. So necessarily, the shortest non-trivial loop, place that B, has to cross the cut locus at least once, and actually exactly once by the previous uh, geodesic, uh, because, because L is geodesic. In other words, you start at B, you walk along the shortest path, you cross the cut locus, and then you get back to B using a, cut, uh, a shortest path. So that's, that's why uh, the cut locus matters. It's really the, the set of points in which the shortest path switches. Different direction. So to be a little bit more formal, <clears throat> uh, for every edge of the cut locus, maybe the yellow one here, <clears throat> let E orthogonal be the shortest loop based at B that uh, crosses E. So it, again, it starts at B, it goes to one side of the edge E using uh, a shortest path, it crosses E and then it goes back to B using a shortest path. Okay, so that's E orthogonal. And the previous slide implies that L is of the form E orthogonal for some edge E. Now, uh, okay, this, this is still a nice, uh, this is already a nice property of the shortest non-trivial loop. But uh, of course, we want an algorithm. So which edges of the cut locus are good? Which edges correspond to non-trivial loops? Well, it turns out that we have a nice characterization for that. Uh, we can actually rephrase topological property into a graph theory uh, question. Look at, uh, for example, this yellow edge here, uh, E. Then the corresponding loop, E orthogonal, it is contractible, it bounds a disk. And this is reflected by the fact that uh, this yellow edge here, when you look at its position uh, in the cut locus, it, is, uh, it has a special position, namely, when you remove this yellow edge in the cut locus, you obtain two, uh, well, two, gra two connected graphs. You're, you're splitting the connected graph, the cut locus into two pieces, one of them being a tree. This is a tree. And that's an if and only if. If you're contract, well, you're contractible, well, your orthogonal is contractible if and only if E splits uh, the cut locus into two pieces, one of them being a tree. For example, this green loop here, it corresponds to this edge E. This edge here, uh, it doesn't separate the cut, the cut locus. Uh, when you remove this yellow edge, the cut locus stays connected. This yellow edge belongs to a cycle of the cut locus. And the claim is that it's really the same as this yellow loop, this green loop, sorry, uh, is non separating, doesn't separate the surface. The third case is black loop here, it corresponds to a yellow edge which splits the, surface, the, the cut locus into two pieces, but both, um, both connected components, after removing this edge, are not trees. Both of them contain, uh, contain cycles. This is exactly the same as this black loop is uh, separating the surface, but non-contractible. So this is quite nice at least for if you want to design algorithms, because you can rephrase purely topological properties of loops into pure graph theory questions. So we have essentially all the ingredients uh, to, for an algorithm now. Um, okay, there are some details, <laughs> but uh, at a high level, the algorithm is the following. So for every point of the surface, maybe not every, but Let's imagine that. We compute the cut locus and uh, we compute the distance from the base point B to every point of the cut locus. Then we remove all the bad edges of the cut locus, uh, the edges that correspond to trivial loops. Uh, so for example, here, this is a trivial, uh, this is a bad edge because when you remove it, you see you will have uh, two connected components, one connected component being a point, a single point, but it counts as a connected component and it's a tree, so uh, you can remove it, sorry. 
this edge here, you can remove it. Now this edge here, you can remove it and so on. So there's an obvious procedure to remove bad edges. And it's easy to see that this greedy algorithm, once uh, you cannot apply it further, once uh, the reduced cut locus doesn't have any degree one vertex anymore, then uh, all the edges are good for homotopy. In, in other words, the corresponding uh, loops e orthogonal are all non-contractible. We have, if you want to, to find the shortest non-separating closed curve, uh, there's a slightly more complicated algorithm. It's well known in graph theory. The, the problem is to compute the set of bridges of a graph. You can compute that uh, efficiently. Okay, so anyway, at this point, we have removed all the bad edges. So there, remove, there remains to compute the shortest loop that crosses the cut locus, well, the reduced cut locus exactly once. So that's easy. And you've done that for a specific point B. You do that for all the points B on the surface, and you remove the shortest among all those loops that you have found. Okay. I've left a few details in the carpet for now, and because I have not defined the metric. So the first question is how to compute efficiently the cut locus. And second is how to, well, uh, we need to bounce the number of uh, choices for the base point. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Um, is it correct to say for the first bullet where you connect, compute the cut locus and the distance from B to each point that you can sort of do those at the same time? Right, so, yeah. right. <clears throat> it depends what uh, on the exact algorithm, but typically, indeed, when you compute the cut locus, um, for, you have in the sense to compute all distances from B. Yes, so that's the same. Um, okay, so let me, okay. Uh, depends on your background, whether your geometers or your more two algorithms, but typically when you study some, um, you want to describe the complexity of algorithms, it's nice to, to, to put yourself in a quite combinatorial setup. So this is what we, what we do here. Even so, all the intuition comes from uh, smooth and smooth surfaces and geometry. So the first setup for uh, having a metric is the embedded graph case where uh, the input is a surface and a graph embedded on it with positive weights or lengths on the edges. And the curve you want to draw must stay in the graphs, in the graph. There are cycles or paths in the graph. Uh, for technical reasons, it's good to, to assume that the graph is cellularly embedded, meaning that each face is a disk. It's filling in the sense. Uh, so if you want to do that, uh, you can reformulate what I said with the cut locus. The cut locus is in a sense, uh, a, well, it's exactly a subgraph of the dual graph of this input graph here. And computing the cut locus is very easy computationally. It's basically computing a shortest path tree ba based at B. So it's the Strauss algorithm. It takes n log n time, where n is the number of vertices and edges of the, of the graph. So computing the shortest non-trivial loop based at b takes n log n time. One uh, slightly, well, sometimes annoying feature is that um, the loop could self-overlap in some cases. This is an example here. Uh, you, you start at b, you go along the shortest path to the cut locus, you go back and then here you see the tail here, you have some overlaps between the beginning and the end of the loop. But that's a minor annoyance. Anyway, if you do that, uh, and if you take the shortest loop of all base points, uh, and here you have n base points, uh, one for each, you, you choose every vertex of the graph in turn to be B, you get an algorithm with running time n square log n. And this is actually due by, to Ericsson and Harpelet uh, in 2004, using a slightly different method. Uh, I will not detail everything here, but just this slide is just here to, to explain that this problem uh, has been studied quite a lot. I mean, there are many 
there have been many papers on this problem, many improvements, many special cases, generalizations, and so on. So, I mean, uh, Ericsson Harper led uh, 2004 is really the landmark, landmark paper for this problem. <clears throat> Another um, framework that you could uh, also look at, which is more topological, I think, is the dual notion of cross metric surfaces. Uh, here, in this case, the input is um, a surface, but also, in addition, some graph with positive weight on the edges, cellularly embedded on the surface. Um, but this time, I mean, the, the curves you draw will not belong to this graph. They, rather, they will be transverse or in general position with respect to the graph. And what is my notion of length now? Uh, well, moving inside a face of the graph is completely free. Uh, so the path from here to here is distance zero. And whenever you want to move from one face to a neighboring face, the distance you have to pay is the weight of the edge that you cross. In other words, so let's compute the, let's describe the length of the blue, uh, the red curve. You walk, okay, sorry. Yeah. You walk along the red curve. Here you cross this edge, so you pay the weight of that edge, plus the weight of that edge, plus the weight of that edge, the weight of that edge, that edge, that edge. You pay twice the weight of that edge, because you cross it twice, plus the weight of that edge. So it's a nice combinatorial description, well, uh, combinatorialization of uh, Riemannian surfaces, if you want. Uh, what is nice also, uh, well, you can think it as a refinement of the previous model, the graph model. Uh, in the graph model, you could have some loops that would run along uh, a, a given edge of the graph. Uh, they would overlap. Here, you have some room, in a sense. You, you could say, oh, I remember that magenta is to the left of blue, which is to the left of red. So in a sense, my black graph here, M, is a dual of the previous graph, well, in the previous slide here. And I have more information because I remember uh, the ordering of these crossings. We have data structures to store, uh, combinatorial maps to store source graphs, and you can do the same. Uh, for the problem of computing shortest non-trivial curves, uh, this cross-metric surface framework is not really needed, but it's important for what comes next. Uh, shortest cut graph with prescribed vertex set. Unless there are any questions. Uh, good. OK. Um, so definition first, so you take any surface and what's a cut graph? A cut graph, it's a graph that is embedded on the surface. And when you cut the surface along it, you obtain a disk, which is the case here for this double torus. Turns out, again, by the paper by Erickson and Harpelet, that computing the shortest cut graph on a cross-metric surface, say, is NP-hard. It's not polynomial type solvable unless P equals NP. Uh, and uh, actually, it turns out that this problem is easy if you fix the vertices of the cut graph. And uh, more specifically, if I give you a cross metric surface, I give you a bunch of points like this one. If you want to compute the shortest cut graph with that vertex set, you can do that in small polynomial time. And this is inspired by a paper by Ericsson and Wittel C uh, earlier. Um, so what's the shortest cut graph with that vertex set is this one. Uh, in other words, the cut graph has to touch all the input points. And the branch points, the vertices of the degree at least three, must be part of the input points. Uh, as a toy a baby example, maybe, if the surface is a sphere, uh, what's a cut locus then? A cut locus is exactly a tree. When you cut the surface, uh, the sphere along a single point is a tree, so you get, you get a disk. Uh, any tree, uh, you cut your, your, surface along, uh, your, your sphere along a tree, you get a disk. So what we have to do, what our algorithm has to do 
in the specific case where the surface is a sphere, we want to compute a minimum spanning tree of the input points, shortest tree connecting those points. Okay, how, what's the algorithm then? So the algorithm will use a variation of the notion of cut locus, this time not based at a single point, but based at all the points in P. And it's very close to the notion of Voronoi diagram. Eric? Yes. Sorry, I have a question. So what's the relationship between cut locus and cut graph? Are they same? Oh, uh, yeah, well, the cut locus is a cut graph in the sense that the cut locus when you cut along it, you get something homeomorphic to a disk. Uh -huh. uh, but there's no reason why the cut locus would be a shortest cut graph in any way. So it's uh -huh. not very useful for compute for well, computing the cut locus helps, but only indirectly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so back to the notion of cut locus with respect to several points. Uh, this is close to the Voronoi diagram. Uh, you grow a disk around each point simultaneously. And whenever you have collisions or self-collisions, you draw a red line and uh, until you, you well, the disks fill the surface completely, right? Again, you, you start with your disks, with your points, you grow disks and so on. You get something like that. So it's a cellular decomposition of your graph, of your surface. Uh, every fa face corresponds to an input point. <clears throat> the cut locus is really the red graph here. It's really the same idea as before. And like before, given an, a red edge, an edge of the cut locus, e, I can define e orthogonal to be the shortest uh, path that connects the two neighboring uh, points crossing that edge. Okay, same idea as before. This is like a Delaunay path, if you want. Here is the uh, a sketch of the algorithm. This is my input point. We compute the cut locus in red. So most of the cut locus drawn here is, uh, sorry, yeah. We compute a spanning tree of the cut locus. Uh, what's a spanning tree? It's a tree, sub a subgraph of the cut locus that is a tree and connects all the vertices. It's drawn here in thick lines. So most of the tree is behind uh, in, on the back of the double torus. Okay, and now what you do is for every edge not in the spanning tree, every thin uh, edge in red, you take its orthogonal. And this is actually what you return. Okay, again, you start with your input points, you compute the cut locus, you take a spanning tree here, you take the orthogonal of the complement of the spanning tree. Okay. Topologically, it's not hard to prove that it's a cut locus, is that it's a cut graph, sorry. And we want to minimize the length of this cut graph. So uh, which spanning tree do we take? We take a maximum spanning tree in a sense. Uh, we maximize the weight of the spanning tree, whereas the weight of a red edge is the length of the corresponding orthogonal uh, Delaunay path. And the claim is that this, if you take uh, the maximum spanning tree uh, as a spanning tree, then what you get is really the shortest cut graph. This requires a proof and I'm running out of time already, sorry. Uh, but it, it actually suffices to prove that every edge of the shortest cut graph is of the form e orthogonal. And for this purpose, you need some algebraic property. Uh, you need, and actually what happens is that the shortest cut graph is uh, a shortest basis of the one dimension homology of the surface relative to P. If you prove that, you can use uh, similarly as before that every, uh, every edge of your cut graph, your shortest cut graph is, uh, is Delaunay or is, um, is geodesic in a sense, okay? Let me skip details, but that's a rough idea. So this gives you an algorithm which is uh, a small polynomial time. Now the question, uh, the obvious question is, okay, we have seen an algorithm to compute 
the shortest cut graph with given vertex set, <clears throat> can we do uh, better for the overall shortest cut graph? Well, I already hinted that no, because it's NP hard. But okay, so in general, the shortest cut graph has big O of G vertices. So the previous uh, algorithm gives us an N to the big O of G time algorithm uh, to compute the overall shortest cut graph. Proof, well, brutally guess the location of the big O of G vertices. This gives us N to the big O of G possibilities uh, in the cross metric case and apply the previous algorithm to all those choices. Actually, Ericsson Hapelet gave a different algorithm for this running time. But the question is, can we do better? And the answer will be no. Uh, well, probably no. Uh, so let me digress a little bit about, uh, well, how do we prove harness in theoretical computer science? Typically proving that there is no algorithm to that that runs quickly to solve a particular problem is very hard. So we do that using, uh, well, assuming some standard conjectures. The most standard one is P different from NP, which you can rephrase as uh, SAT Boolean satisfiability problem cannot be solved in polynomial time. Here we need some uh, stronger uh, conjecture, which is already quite uh, used which is the exponential time hypothesis due to impact years of Paturi Zane uh, more than 20 years ago. It says something different. It doesn't say that SAT cannot be solved in polynomial time. It says that it cannot be solved in sub-exponential time. So it's a stronger conjecture. Uh, technically, it says that there is a positive constant such that SAT formulas of size n cannot be solved in big O of two to the cn time, okay? So it, it's stronger than P different from NP. And what we proved recently with Vincent Canada and Daniel Marx and Arnaud de Mesmet is that assuming this exponential time hypothesis, then one cannot compute shortest cut graphs in this amount of time, in N to the big O of G over log G, to be compared to the big O of G here. In other words, this I mean, one cannot do much better uh, to compute the shortest cut graph, assuming ETH, and up to a log G factor. Okay, log G factor. Here. Um, let me just give a glimpse on the hard instances. Um, here is the genus for surface, and the shortest cut graph of that surface, I mean, we choose the metric so that the shortest cut graph will look like this. Uh, it will be a four regular cut graph that is an expander. Uh, okay, let me skip details, but intuitively it has large tree widths if you know what it is, or it doesn't have any small separator. You don't have a small set of vertices that split the graph into two pieces. And actually uh, the metric will be refined uh, so that the exact location of all the yellow vertices will encode values for some variables in a problem that is known to be hard. The problem hard uh, is generalized grid tiling. Uh, it relies on some gadget by Max. I, I don't have much time to, to detail this, but essentially the location of each vertex here encodes a pair of variables, each between one and D where D is an integer. And you can embed grid tile, well, generally the grid tiling problem into the shortest cut graph problem. So generalized grid tiling essentially says something like this. Uh, this yellow square here corresponds to a vertex of the shortest cut graph. And uh, each vertex has a bunch of locations here in green, some cells you can use, you can locate your, uh, your vertex, one among D times D uh, possibilities for each vertex. And a positive instance of generalized grid tiling is a set of, well, you have to choose one location in each uh, yellow square, maybe those red ones here, so that uh, when you're vertically aligned, you must be on the same column here. 
those two are in the same column. And well, when you're horizontally aligned with another neighbor, you must be on the same row. This problem is known to be hard under ATH. Uh, that's this lower bound. And uh, since you can model such, such problems using shorter scale graph problem, you must, uh, you must be, it must be hard to compute shorter scale graphs. As a side remark, uh, why did I take an expander here? If you take an arbitrary four regular cut graph, which has small separators, you could apply a dynamic programming approach. You can basically guess which uh, cell here is taken for a, for a separator and recurse. So that would not be hard. You need something that has large tributes. Sorry, that was a bit fast, but I hope it conveys somehow the, uh, the idea how to, why, why this problem is hard. Computing shortest cut graph is hard. It's n to the big O of g over log g, at least. Let me conclude uh, by one open problem, which is, sorry, computing the shortest pants decomposition. A pants decomposition is a set of simple disjoint cycles in the surface that split the surface into pairs of pants. This is a pair of pants. And uh, the open problem I would like to mention is computing the shortest pants decomposition. So in some cases, it's not how to compute those in hyperbolic surfaces. There's a big, big Epstein to do that. In some cases, we have some bounds on the total length of the shortest bounds decompositions uh, inspired by uh, Buzzer. But uh, it could be that the shortest bounds decomposition is much shorter than the one uh, than the given by those bounds. And we'd like to compute it. And we don't know how to do that. There's no vertices in shortest in pants decomposition. So, so uh, it's really hard to, to know what we do. I mean, the preview techniques uh, rely on base point or guessing the vertices. It's hard to imagine how to transfer those techniques for computing shortest pants decomposition. So we would really like to know whether it's solvable in polynomial time, whether it's empty hard, polynomial for fixed genus, whether we can approximate it and so on. And um, unfortunately, we don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I feel that we unmute ourselves and thank Eric for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Any questions? I'll, I'll start with a question, Eric. So um, do these algorithms or similar algorithms work for surfaces with boundary? Uh, yes. Well, actually, uh, it's not very different. I mean, shortest non-contractible, uh, it works. You can adapt it to so that it works directly for surfaces with boundary. Or equivalently, you could just uh, glue a handle to every boundary component, and then you're back to your problem for surfaces without boundary. Mm -hmm. And for non-separating, it works uh, really the same way. For shortest cut graph, Yes, it's the same same idea. Yes, it would work. And then have have you or others? I mean, I'm sure the problems get much harder on um, three manifolds, right? Where the the graphs become, you know, say surfaces or two dimensional things. But are there restricted classes of three manifolds where people have? Uh, right. No, I don't think people have uh, really looked into this. Um, I mean, actually deciding whether a curve is contractible or not on a three manifold is something complicated, and I have some works on that, uh, already in restricted cases, and some colleagues also. Um, so even the decision problem is hard. So uh, of, of course, the natural idea would be, okay, take reuse the idea of cut locus, but take it one dimension higher. So this gives you a bunch of surfaces in the three manifold. and um certainly true that the shortest non-contractible closed curve base at B must cross the cut locus exactly once. Uh, now the question is how to read off the topology to recast. Uh, I mean, is here we in the surface case, we have a nice way to reformulate topology into uh, graph theory, which I, I don't think it would work. Uh, or maybe there's a clever way to do that, but at least I don't know how to do that for the case mm -hmm. of uh, three manifolds. Mm -hmm. 
I have one. So maybe I missed, but what is the what are the applications of shortest cut graph? Why people care about the shortest cut graph? Uh, okay, so there are two two reasons that I know. One uh, is the so I'm not so much into applications, but uh, when you want to put a texture uh, on the surface with handles, you somehow need to cut the surface in, uh, into a disk uh, because, well, you want to, or say differently, you want to parameterize the surface. You, well, it's, it's, you need to cut somewhere. There's no homeomorphism. I mean, a sphere, you can, you just remove one point and you're good, you, you, you get a disk. Uh, at the world torus, it's not the case. And in more uh, theoretical areas, um, in graph algorithms, uh, such techniques have actually been used uh, to design more efficient algorithms for uh, cut problems, multi-cut problems. Some problems that really come from graph algorithms, which uh, are hard in general, but are tra become tractable, have some small complexity for planar or logenous graphs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank Eric again and let me stop the recording.